Welcome to the Age of Fission radio show with your host, Wani Clark. We stand together and accept we now live in a world transformed by the nuclear industry. We expose and confront the intentional neglect and disregard for life on our planet by atomic energy. Consider social engineering programs who view our bodies, minds, and souls as assets on a balance sheet. We discuss vital current issues, interview activists, and engage our audience in an effort to allow all voices to be heard. We encourage our listeners to reclaim their power and their courage to take action to save our planet from the ravages of greed and indifference. Every voice matters. Our actions matter. We remind our listeners that happiness is resistance. Love is greater than fear. Good evening. This is your host, Lonnie Clark, with the Age of Fission radio show. I want to thank each and every one of you for joining our radio show. And I want to thank you for telling your friends about it and for sharing it on social media and sharing the information that you hear on our radio program. The reason we do the radio program is to spread the news and to let people know what's really going on with the nuclear liars because they are quite happily poisoning us while everybody else is in nuclear denial. We've all been brainwashed to just ignore the negative effects. In fact, there is a story this week uh, that's on Google and it's been sent to me by several people that talks about we don't need to be worried about depleted uranium because now there's a use for it. Well, just because it's useful does not mean it is any less harmful. Ask the people of Fallujah. So, I want to thank everyone who joins us, and I'm grateful that you're listening and that you care enough about our planet to really dig in and find out for yourself. Honestly, everything that's shared here, it's all, it's none of it is just hearsay. I mean, I tell you when I have my own intuitive opinions about stuff, but when I bring you information like I'm going to tonight, these are real experts, and they uh, have used government information categorically, uncategorically, you know, like scientifically sound. None of it is questionable. So none of it is just hearsay. But what it is is underreported and people do not know about it. And people kind of know about it. But I would think most of the people were like I was eight or nine years ago before Fukushima where I thought the government was not lying to us, that they were protecting us, and that they were handling things. Well, I think anybody who's paying attention in today's America knows for a fact, in fact, on this radio show, I did report to you several months ago about how the Trump administration, with the help of Rick Perry, reclassified uh, highly level radioactive waste, 100,000 gallons of it, and they are reclassifying it as low-level waste. So so they can bury it, and I I reported on this. It's all dirty money. These people, you know, one guy contributed a million dollars to Rick Perry's governor campaign since the early 2000s. I mean, this is a long-term plan. It is Perry pushing this for these people who are paying him. The other guy who got the contract contributed, they said anywhere from 250 to 360 to Donald Trump's campaign. So... You know, the numbers are unclear because Donald Trump's a liar, and that's the real reality. There is not really full disclosure. Um, But I I am very excited about this week's show because I got permission from Carl Grossman, who has been a guest on our show before, and good news, he will be coming back to talk to us about the Space Force, and I talk about him all the time in his book, Weapons in Space, that he wrote. I read it here on our radio show back in March, and you can look on my podcast uh, on Spreaker or on my YouTube channel, Nuts for Art, and look back a long time ago. It's still listed. This week's radio show, I'm going to be playing a half an hour audio clip of a YouTube channel. I converted uh, Carl. There, Carl hosts something called Enviro Video One. That's the title of the YouTube channel, E-M-V-I-R-O. V-I-D-E-O number one, Enviro Video one. And their YouTube channel, it's, it's Carl Grossman interviewing various 
anti-nuke activist. I, I have not really ever seen him interview anyone who wasn't an anti-nuke activist, but I know he does a lot of investigative journalism um, on not just radioactive waste. He also does it on other contaminants in our environment and social injustices in his little neck of the woods, which is in Massachusetts. Or No, it's not. Where is he? It's not Massachusetts, though. I'll have to ask him. New York or back east. Sorry, Carl, I don't remember where you live. It'll hit me in a minute. But anyways, tonight's audio, let me just read from you because you can go to, please do subscribe to Carl to this YouTube channel because we need this information to get out. So if you're listening to my radio show, the Age of Fission radio show, with me, your host, Lonnie Clark, uh, you can actually share this, and we pre please, please, and I'm going to ask this again. Please do share this information. Don't take our word for it. Look this stuff up. If you find anything that we've said that is, you know, completely off, as when you hear things that's going to come up on this, let us know. And you can send me comments at my YouTube, you know, uh, thing called Nuts for Art. N U T Z F O R A R T. That's my uh, Gmail address. So you can say anything to me as long as you're respectful. I do not like insults, and I will not respond to those because that's abuse. And I do insist on real information, real science, not the, uh, you know, bananas are safe for us uh, routine because the radiation coming from a banana is not the same as man-made contamination, and that is what is the issue. Man-made radioactive contamination is the real, I mean, on top of the normal radiation that, do, yes, does kill us, that does cause certain diseases, but this stuff is highly toxic, and there is a big, huge problem with depleted uranium and all uranium products. So Kevin Camps is going to go into this. It's titled, The Threat of Nuclear Waste with Kevin Camps. Radioactive Waste Specialist Kevin Camps of the organization Beyond Nuclear details the major push by the Trump administration and nuclear industry to dump nuclear waste in Texas and New Mexico. His group with other organizations is challenging this scheme to establish a nuclear sacrifice area for the whole country. And because the transportation of nuclear waste from all over the U.S. to this area, tens of thousands of shipments by train, truck, and barge this is everyone's problem, and that is in quote, that comes from Beyond Nuclear. Kevin Camps also discusses the insanity, quote, in quotes, planned in Canada to put nuclear waste on the shoreline of Lake Michigan. They've been do it, talking about this for quite a while. There's been a lot of pushback. So this goes on to say, Camps and Grossman speak of once nuclear pr proponent Admiral Hyman Rickover's call in 1982 to outlaw nuclear reactors. They talk, too, about the Trump administration's advocacy of hormesis. That is, radioactivity is good for you, says Camps. It's mad science, preposterous and absurd. Let me just add what this is. Please do look up the idea of hormesis, because hormesis means uh, and those of us in Oregon know what this is because we have a candidate that always runs against our, our congressman, Peter DeFazio, here in Lane County, who believes in hormesis. He gives his kids radioactive waste in their water. He thinks it's good. He's of these proponents that think you just need a little bit in it and your body, our bodies will acclimate because of the fact that we have been poisoned since the nuclear bomb era started. They started bombing us. They have done nothing but neglect the waste. There is so much plutonium, cesium-137. It's why we have a cancer epidemic. It's why the oceans are dying. Yes, I think I propose this to Chris Busby. I think that along with the fossil fuel thing, the nuclear waste in the oceans that we have dumped and have not even accounted for is extremely, extremely, to my opinion, very... Uh, intrinsic to the dying off of microscopic life in the oceans that the animals at the bottom of the food chain eat that go all the way up to the whales. So 
you know, we. this is why I do my radio podcast, folks, because we are in a sense of urgency. And I know I sound like Bernie the Boomer. <laughs> Maybe I am. Maybe it's because my generation of people, we thought that it was being handled, and it really, for me, the sense of urgency, the bells are alarming the more I learn about nuclear waste. Like, the more I find out about it, the more compelled I am to bring you this. So I am going to stop talking, and I will talk to you guys on the other side because I am going to make some commentary about this um, video conversation that you'll be hearing the audio of. There's, there won't be much you will not understand, even though it's going to be the audio of a video. Anyways, I'll talk to you guys on the other side. Ciao. The threat of nuclear waste next on Enviro Close Up. Welcome to Enviro Close Up. I am Carl Grossman with Kevin Camps. He's the radioactive waste specialist of the organization Beyond Nuclear, and he's been deeply involved in battling the, the push by the Trump administration and the nuclear industry to dump nuclear waste in Texas and New Mexico. Welcome, Kevin. Now, what is going on? Well, you know, for a generation now, the nuclear power establishment and industry and government has tried to dump their wastes on western Shoshone Indian land at Yucca Mountain, Nevada, and they have not gotten away with it. There's been too much resistance. So there's a plan B that they're working on, and it's uh, very near term. It's called Consolidated Interim Storage Facilities. They used to call it Monitored Retrievable Storage Sites. They've tried this in the past. They've never gotten away with it. Pitched battles that lasted years. The current targets for consolidated interim storage are Holtec International in New Mexico and Waste Control Specialists in Texas. And the two sites are only 39 miles apart. So what they're trying to do is turn this area on either side of the New Mexico-Texas state line into a nuclear sacrifice area for the whole country. And they've got a huge cheerleader in Trump's energy secretary, Rick Perry, when Rick Perry was governor of Texas, when he ran for president as a Republican, including in 2016, his top campaign contributor was a Dallas billionaire named Harold Simmons, the king of Superfund sites. And one of Harold Simmons' businesses was waste control specialists in Texas. So Perry, for many years now, has been a supporter of a national low-level radioactive waste dump, which is well underway at Waste Control Specialist Texas. And he's also a huge supporter of bringing in high-level radioactive waste. They call it interim storage, which means temporary. That's a lie. So last spring, in a House hearing, Rick Perry was asked a question. Would you support permanent storage at waste control specialists for the high level? And he said, yes, he's fine with it. The people of Andrews County are fine with it. We should do that. That's fine. What's incredible about that, for one thing, is there's huge resistance at the grassroots in Andrews County, Texas and neighboring communities, which are predominantly Hispanic. So again, it's an environmental justice issue. But it flies in the face of the Department of Energy's own warnings that if high-level radioactive waste remains at the surface of the planet for a long enough period of time into the future, with loss of institutional controls, it is going to leak out of its containers. And this would be a radioactive catastrophe that now is on the winds and on the waters and poisoning people. So it's incredible that he's taken this position, and I'm glad that that is out in the open because any notion that this is temporary is false. It would become a de facto permanent surface storage site that would eventually leak. Now, Beyond Nuclear and other organizations have been involved in, in litigation uh, and other efforts to, uh, to stop this. How are you doing? We are up to our eyeballs in this fight in both New Mexico and Texas. So Beyond Nuclear has great legal counsel, Diane Curran of Washington, D.C., Mindy Goldstein of Atlanta, Georgia, and we have a single legal challenge, and it is that these proposals are illegal. The Nuclear Waste Policy Act, the law of the land on these matters that dates back to 1982, it's been amended several times since, 
says that the Department of Energy cannot take ownership, cannot take title, cannot take on the liability for commercial high-level radioactive waste, irradiated nuclear fuel, at an interim facility. It's not allowed. And there's a lot of wisdom behind that decision by Congress, you know, decades ago. It's because of this risk that interim temporary will become permanent, and that cannot happen at the surface. So Congress said you can't take ownership at an interim site. The only place you can take ownership is at a permanent deep geologic disposal repository, which we do not have, which the Department of Energy has admitted recently cannot happen until 2048 at the earliest, decades from now. So incredibly, these companies, Holtec International in New Mexico, Waste Control Specialists, now called Interim Storage Partners in Texas, they've just done an end run around that legal prohibition. And what's most incredible of all is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which presides over these licensing proceedings, has allowed them to do that. So that's beyond nuclear's legal argument. We have to exhaust all administrative remedies, which means we have to see these licensing proceedings conclude at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. As soon as they do, we are straight to federal court. We even have the paperwork turned in already at the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, the second highest court in the land. We would like to end these licensing proceedings as soon as possible because they are, they are illegal on their face. So that's our legal strategy. We have a broad coalition of allies, grassroots environmental groups, national environmental groups that are taking on the million and other reasons that these dumps are bad ideas, from the transportation risks to the geological flaws of the sites proposed. I mean, for one thing, both sites are in the Permian Basin. This is the most active oil and natural gas field in North America, if you can believe that, more than the Canadian tar sands. They want to put high-level radioactive waste in the middle of the most active fossil fuel extraction industry in this country. There's an oil company called Faskin Oil, which is strange bedfellows. They are right there with us in these NRC licensing proceedings, and I hope that they will appeal to the federal courts because the writing is on the wall. NRC is going to rubber stamp both dump sites. And then we have a uh, you know, nationwide grassroots coalition. A lot of those groups, because of the transportation impacts, the roads, the rails, the waterways through their areas of the country, be it New York, be it California, be it the Great Lakes, these proposals will see tens of thousands of shipments of high-level radioactive waste flowing by truck, by train, by barge through most states in the lower 48, through 100-plus major cities, major urban centers, through the vast majority of U.S. congressional districts. This is everybody's problem. The same can be said of the Yucca Mountain Dump, which we continue to have to fight to this day. The transportation makes this everybody's problem. What can just people, viewers out there do to, to, to help your case? Well, uh, New Mexico is a great example. Um, there is a groundswell of opposition to this proposal. And partly uh, what that has resulted in is not only a blue wave that happened in New Mexico in the last elections. Now there's a Democratic governor, uh, two Democratic senators, three Democratic House members at the federal level and also Democratic State Legislature, Democratic Public Lands Commissioner. And guess what that results in? That results in the governor, Michelle Lujan Grisham, in June saying Holtec is a bad idea. It results in the Public Lands Commissioner, um, Stephanie Garcia, saying this is a bad idea. And Deb Holland, one of the first Native Americans ever elected to Congress, coming out and saying this is a bad idea. And a part of that mix is this groundswell of opposition to Holtec. There's many other issues going on in New Mexico. But that's the kind of change that can be won when people get involved. The fight is not over in New Mexico, but at least we have a fighting chance now because the Republican candidate for governor, who was very pro-Holtec, lost his election. And uh, that is a model that can be deployed in Texas, can be deployed. We're facing another radioactive waste threat besides what we've talked about, it's called Deep Isolation Incorporated. It's a deep borehole technology. It's related to fracking. What they want to do, and you know, truth be told, they want to do on-site disposal of the high-level radioactive wastes wherever they can get away with it. We made a clamor in the Great Lakes where I'm very active, and they said, oh, we didn't mean the Great Lakes. Yes, they did mean the Great Lakes, but they met our clamor, and they decided it was not the path of least resistance. 
So recently this year, they did a test drill in Texas, which I think uh, indicates that they're interested to set up shop as close to the consolidated interim storage as possible so that instead of consolidated interim storage eventually exporting to the Yucca Dump, which will never happen, Nevada, the Western Shoshone, and a thousand environmental groups across this country will not let the Yucca Dump happen. So here now you have a combination of consolidated interim storage in Texas, New Mexico, and this company, Deep Isolation, proposing deep borehole disposal nearby. So we have all these fights going on. That's in the U.S. On the Canadian side, there's this imaginary line through the Great Lakes, Canada to the north, U.S. to the south. There is insanity being proposed on the Canadian side. They want to do what they call a deep geologic repository on the shoreline of Lake Michigan, within a mile of the water, at the largest nuclear power plant on the planet. It's called Bruce Nuclear Generating Station. Nine reactors on one site. No cooling towers dumping all that waste heat into Lake Huron. They now want to bury all the low and intermediate level radioactive waste of Ontario, 20 reactors on that site. And truth be told, they would like to bring the high level waste in, if not in the same dump, at a nearby dump. This is Saugeen Ojibwe Nation territory. This is indigenous people's land, the environmental injustice of it. So we have so many fights with radioactive waste going on. When people hear the word radioactive waste, I mean, the waste is the important uh, word. I mean, it, it's, I think a lot of people think it's going to like uh, ashes from a fire. It's, it, it's waste. But in fact, when nuclear material is put into a reactor, it's mildly radioactive, very mildly radioactive. But there's a process when you split the atom of fission which causes horrible poisons, terrible poisons to be created. Poisons, some of them be around millions of years and more. That's what radioactive waste is, not, not ashes from some nuclear process. Can you explain th this process of from mildly radioactive to hotly radioactive and it's going to be here for eternity? Well, uranium in nature is already a toxic heavy metal and radioactive. And actually, some of the progeny from uranium in the decay chain are intensely radioactive and highly hazardous. These are natural radioactive elements, things like polonium-210. So, for example, Putin used polonium-210, which exists in nature. It comes off of uranium as a decay product. Concentrated polonium-210 was used to assassinate the Russian dissident Litvinenko in London in 2006. It's a hazardous poison, it's intensely radioactive. So that's in nature. But what the nuclear power do industry does is it takes uranium out of the earth, where at least the earth was some buffer against these hazards. It refines it, it concentrates it, and that's bad enough, the, the natural uranium or even the um, uranium that's been processed. But like you said, once uranium as a fuel is irradiated and a chain reaction takes place and atoms are split in an atomic reactor, it comes out a million times more radioactive. And you've also created artificial radioactive isotopes that nature has no idea what to do with, like our bodies have no idea what to do with plutonium. These are ultra-hazardous substances, cesium-137, strontium-90, iodine-131, plutonium-239. These are artificial radioactive isotopes that do not exist in nature. They are generated in atomic reactors. They are constituents, uh, the long-lasting the long stuff. I mean, iodine-131 was a culprit at Chernobyl, at Fukushima, caused a lot of health damage, but it only has an eight-day half-life, 80 days of hazard, and then it dissipates. But cesium-137 has a 30-year half-life, 300 years of hazard, strontium-90, about the same as cesium. Plutonium-239 has a 24,000-year half-life. That's 240,000 years of hazard. And there's other stuff in there. We won a major lawsuit in 2004 against the Yucca Mountain dump proposal that was instrumental in slowing it down so that Obama could get elected and cancel it in 2010. And our victory was that the powers that be, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, they wanted to cut off regulations at Yucca Mountain after just 10,000 years. No more regulations. Whatever comes out, that's the way it is. 
Well, like I just said, some of these poisons last a lot longer than 10,000 years, and we convinced the court of that. They ordered EPA back to the drawing board. It took EPA four years to rewrite its regulations, but when they came back, they admitted a million years of hazard associated with high-level radioactive waste at Yucca Mountain. That's starting to get somewhere, but there's one constituent, iodine-129, in high-level radioactive waste that has a 15 million year half-life, 150 million years of hazard. So even that low ball one million years of hazard is a great underestimate of the potency of these poisons and their longevity. Yeah, in terms of these poisons, it, this is a book I wrote originally in 1980 after the, well, 79 was the Three Mile Island accident. And I sat down and I began doing research and like the book is full of facsimiles of statements uh, in often government documents. I use a lot of them and uh, industry documents. In fact, if, if listeners, if viewers would like to get a copy of this book for free, just go on my website. You get the latest edition. You can download it for free zero. Just go to www.carlgrossman, one word, carlgrossman.com. And, well, the publishers are being very generous, and uh, the latest edition, uh, post Fukushima edition, of cover up what you're not supposed to know about nuclear power is available for free. And I, I point this out because uh, uh, this is the more recent editions where I was able to use the testimony of Admiral Hyman Rickover when he retired from the Navy in 1982. And Rickover is considered the father of the nuclear Navy of the United States. And also he was in charge of the construction of the first nuclear, civilian nuclear power plant in the U.S. shipping port in Pennsylvania. But somehow, 1982, Rickover saw the light. Uh, must have been some sort of epiphany. And here he is, uh, and again, this is page 285 of the book. Uh, get a copy, download a copy. And uh, I, I just quote Rickover's testimony uh, before a uh, was the Joint Economic Committee of Congress. And he says, I'll be philosophical. Until about uh, two billion years ago, it was impossible to have any life on Earth. There was so much radiation on Earth, you couldn't have any life, fish or anything. But gradually, the amount of radiation on this planet reduced, made it possible for some form of life to begin. Uh, and that amount of radiation has been decreasing because all radiation has a half-life, which means ultimately there'll be no radiation. But now he goes on, when we go back to, when we, go, when we use nuclear power, we are creating something which nature tried to destroy to make life possible. Every time you produce radiation, a horrible force is unleashed. Uh, and I think there the human race is going to wreck itself. And what he's speaking about is uh, are these highly toxic, these unbelievably toxic poisons that are created in the, the nuclear process. And, and then he goes on that what he thinks we have to do is to, and again, I'm quoting, I'm quoting Rickover, not uh, Beyond Nuclear or Greenpeace. We must outlaw nuclear reactors, outlaw nuclear reactors. To me, that, that's the bottom line, that, that these poisons, this nuclear waste, is, is, kills life, destroys life. Uh, it, it, it really is the same sort of poisons that existed before life could begin on Earth. And it's recreation in our time. Uh, well, it's Rickover. Will destroy life unless we outlaw nuclear reactors, and he goes on, outlaw nuclear power. High-level radioactive waste is a curse on all future generations. So we have to isolate it from the environment, like I said, with plutonium uh, for 240,000 years, as long as we've been a species, essentially. Iodine-129 for 150 million years, way longer than we've been a species, unimaginable forever time frames. How do you isolate this from the environment for that long? It will get out. It will get into people's food and water and air. 
There are also acute hazards. Those are the long-term hazards, breathing in a speck of plutonium-239 or, or ingesting iodine-129. But in the near term, in the first thousand years of the existence of high-level radioactive waste, you have to worry about the gamma and neutron radiation that's streaming off. What that means is there has to be radiation shielding between the high-level radioactive waste and any living beings for that first thousand years, or the neutron, neutron and gamma radiation will kill a person at a close enough distance within seconds or minutes, depending on how long it's been out of the reactor core. And so those kind of risks are what we're dealing with. So when they propose to move this stuff through the south side of Chicago, the west side of Chicago, and something goes wrong, there's a severe accident, there's a terrorist attack, and this stuff is unleashed into people's neighborhoods, that's where you get radiation poisoning deaths, like happened to the firefighters and the plant personnel at Chernobyl. But besides those immediate deaths or those near-term deaths, you have the exposure to low-dose radiation that will result in cancers over years or decades, that will result in genetic damage that then the human race carries forward into the future, that will result in birth defects to any fetus in the womb that's exposed to these hazards. Those are the risks involved with high-level radioactive waste. So there's very high stakes. There's no margin for error. An issue that gets very little play that's very significant is the shortcuts on safety being taken at the nuclear power plants where the waste is right now. So when it comes out of the reactor, it first goes into a giant pool of water. They're called wet pools. They're called high-level radioactive waste storage pools. And it's been well documented for a long time now that you could lose the cooling water in a pool. It could happen suddenly, like with a drain down, or it can happen more slowly over days or weeks, a boil down of that water. Once this irradiated nuclear fuel is exposed to air, it's quickly going to overheat within an hour or so, and then it will catch fire. The zirconium metal cladding will reach its ignition temperature, and once that happens, it's all over. It would be an order of magnitude or orders of magnitude worse than a reactor meltdown because the pools are not in radiological containment. They're in warehouse buildings. This almost happened at Fukushima Daiichi, Unit 4. It did not happen there because of sheer luck. And if it had happened there, instead of 160,000 nuclear evacuees, there could have been as many as 50 million. And it's not me saying this. It's the Prime Minister of Japan, Naoto Kan, who served during the first months of the Fukushima catastrophe, who admitted on the first anniversary in early 2012, he had a secret contingency plan in the works. If Unit 4's pool had caught fire, they were planning to evacuate 35 to 50 million people from northeastern Japan. And he said it would have been the end of the Japanese state. Those are the pool risks that we live with in the United States on a daily basis, only nobody knows about it. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission is allowing this to happen as we speak. In terms of, in my book, I also write about zirconium. I interview a scientist for Westinghouse, in fact, and describes how they look for uh, cladding, something that would allow the neutrons to uh, fly around in a reactor. And they looked at this metal and that metal, and they finally decided on, on zirconium. And the only other major industrial use of zirconium at the time was the speck on a flashbulb that explodes. That was zirconium, and at a certain point, and not that hot a temperature, it explodes. Before that, it releases hydrogen gas. That's the reason for the hydrogen bubble in the Three Mile Island nuclear plant accident scenario with the hydrogen that was emitted out of the Fukushima uh, uh, nuclear power plants. So you have these nuclear fuel pools, uh, these waste pools, uh, with these the used fuel rods, but the fuel rods are coated with this hotly, uh, extremely dangerous substance, uh, zirconium. An example, though, I, I would like to talk about this too, of, of how ridiculous the nuclear industry and our government is in regards to nuclear technology, is that, again, we're hearing talk of hormesis. The nuclear industry has tried to claim that actually radioactivity is, is good for you. It's healthy. It exercises the immune system. And in recent times, the, the Trump administration has began pushing hormesis as a theory, too, that 
radioactivity is good for you. What do you think about that? It's mad science. It's quackery. Um, they, they play a lot of games with the truth in the nuclear power industry. I've thought of that during the Trump era, that you know it seems so unprecedented, President Trump, and the, the assault on basic facts and knowledge and the truth on a daily, hourly basis. And it occurred to me at one point that actually we've been dealing with this for a long time, fighting the nuclear power industry. They play these games themselves in their own arena, their own industry. Hormesis is an example of that, where they try to convince people that ionizing radioactivity that causes cancer, that causes birth defects, that causes genetic damage can somehow be good for you. It's absurd. It's preposterous. But they have to because they have to calm people down about these risks. We've been talking about catastrophes, disasters, accidents, terrorist attacks. What about the daily operation of atomic reactors? There are routine releases of radioactivity into air and water that then enters the food chain, reconcentrates, and humans are at the top of the food chain eating and drinking these reconcentrated radioactivity doses if they live close enough to nuclear power plants, which are allowed, permitted, by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to emit radioactivity as a course of normal business. An incredible quote from Fukushima, for example, in the earliest days before they realized how serious the world was taking this catastrophe that was unfolding, was a Tokyo Electric Power Company spokesman who said, why are you getting so upset about these releases into the ocean from this accident? We would release 10% this amount normally, anyway, running the reactors. It was a very revealing statement that they try not to make because they do let a lot of radioactivity go on a normal day at a nuclear power plant. There's a, a small reactor in Michigan that shut down in 1997, Big Rock Point. I compiled their admitted releases that they reported to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, to air, to water. They released 3.2 million curies of radioactivity into the environment over the course of their operations. And that didn't even include the first few years of operations because they didn't keep good records back then. Those would have been the worst years, by the way. By comparison, a major medical institution like Washington University in St. Louis, which has a research hospital, has two curies of radioactivity in the entire hospital that they very carefully control because it's dangerous. Two curies at this little atomic reactor, 67 megawatts up in northern Michigan, one-fifteenth the size of a modern reactor. They let go of 3.2 million curies of harmful radioactivity into the environment and didn't account for where it went. They like you to believe that it disappears into nothingness. It does not disappear into nothingness. People breathe it. People eat it. It actually reconcentrates in the food chain. It's called bioaccumulation. To give you an example, at Big Rock Point, after they shut down, they had radioactive algae wash back up the discharge canal from Lake Michigan and set off the radiation alarms. This is six months after closure. The radioactive algae set off the radiation alarms. So what was their response? To dismantle the radiation alarms. They don't want people to know. Yeah, that's why I titled the book, Cover Up What You're Not Supposed to Know About Nuclear Power. I begin it. You've not been informed about nuclear power. You haven't been told. That's been done on purpose. Keeping the public in the dark was deemed necessary by the promoters of nuclear power if it was... Uh, to succeed in the cover-up, I'm sorry to say, continues. Uh, Kevin Camps breaks through that cover-up and uh, and fights this, this this monstrous activity. Thanks so much for your work, Kevin Camps. Uh, this has been Enviro Close-Up. I'm Carl Grossman. Thank you for watching. And check out the other programs of Enviro Video on our website, envirovideo.com. Well, I'm really grateful to Carl Grossman and Enviro Video for allowing me to play this Kevin Camps interview with Carl Grossman that was uh, published on YouTube on 1-13-2020. So I went through my past um, podcasts and dug out like a little seven-minute clip where I actually reported on this interim story so when they were writing all this uh, on, in June of 2019, 
I reported on a story that I think was written in October of 2018, and it, it mentions this lady, Ann White, who actually wrote the legislation and where she came from. It's very telling as to why this happened now and who put Trump in office. This is super telling. Anyways, I'll come back on the other side. I'm just going to plug this in. I think you'll you'll uh, really appreciate this information. I found a story from October of t- twenty October 26th from Salon Magazine in 2018. So eight or nine months ago, right? This is when they started talking about it. The dump site. The energy secretary could ship treated nuclear waste from our nation's most political nuclear weapons production site to a Texas nuclear dump near an aquifer supplying water to northern Texas and South Dakota. The dump was opened by one of Rick Perry's largest campaign donors. This this is where they're send this plan is in action. This is not just hey, let's talk about it. This is what Rick Perry recently approved, and this lady, Ann White, wrote up, and you will hear why she wrote this up. The Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982, signed by former President Reagan, Ronald Reagan, was written to prevent potential disasters and mandates that the Department of Energy must send high-level waste to a network of underground tunnels and rooms where it can be safely, where it can safely decay over millions of years. I have something else to talk about on that one. Republicans and Trump's new assistant secretary for environmental management, Anne Marie White, who did consulting work for the company that operates the dump site, wants to rewrite federal regulations, which she did, to say that some high-level nuclear waste isn't really high-level nuclear waste, so it can be stored elsewhere. It certainly raises questions about potential interest conflicts of interest at Tom Carpenter, the executive director of Hanford Challenge, a Seattle watchdog group. Dallas billion Dallas billionaire Harold Simmons, who died in 2013 at the age of 82, owned Waste Control Specialists. Simmons and his wife Annette gave Perry's campaign more than $1.3 million. And I looked that up to see when they did it. And they, they did it early in like uh, 2006 and earlier years. Waste Control Specialist got its licenses in Texas in 2008 and 2009 to dispose of radioactive waste in a dump at Andrews County in the Texas-New Mexico border adjacent to the giant Urenco USA nuclear enrichment facility in Eunice, New Mexico. Perry, the then governor, appointed the three commissioners of the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality who approved the licenses. Really, it's not that unusual. Anybody who works for the nuclear industry approves every license they want. It's extremely rare that anyone in the nuclear industry turns down the licensees. They always get what they want over, really literally over death, what the death that they're causing the people. Back to the story on Salon. The dump is over or near the Ogallala Aquifer, and that is spelled O-G-A-L-L-A-L-A, Aquifer, if you want to look it up on on a map. Depending on whether you believe the water table boundaries of the com- of the company or others, the dump is also on an earthquake hazard zone. Oh, great. Nothing's going to go wrong, right, folks? Waste control specialists want to take the radioactive waste from the Hanford Nuclear Weapons Complex in southeast Washington State, one of the most contaminated places on Earth. About 56 million gallons of radioactive waste and chemical waste produced during World War II and the Cold War, and it's stored in 177 tanks. Hanford was created during the Manhattan Project in World War II and made the plutonium for the atomic bomb dropped at Nagasaki, Japan. 
Waste control specialists say it could save the federal government up to $16.5 million. Who said that? Anne Marie White said that because she was a specialist for waste control management at the time that this was stated. The dump would take the waste after cesium is removed and it is encased in grout. In December, three gallons of waste or about 0.000053% of the waste in the underground tanks was encapsulated in grout as a test. So they just did it in December and they encapsulated it a tiny bit. I, I just, it blows me away the level of disregard. They called this Less than 1% of the waste, they tested 0.000053%. I mean, how many zeros? That's one, two, three, four, five. Five zeros in front of 0 .5, five zeros. I don't even know. That's 103, I guess I could calculate it on my my waste because we've got 53 million gallons. Republicans have previously reclassified nuclear waste as less dangerous. In 2004, Senator Lindsey Graham, the murderer, attached a rider to the defense authorization bill so that the Department of Energy didn't have to remove radioactive sludge from the underground storage tanks in South Carolina and Idaho. And that is the end of the story. Too bad, isn't it? How they have to shorten all this stuff up. But there are more stories, folks. If you really want to go look at them, you certainly can. And so there was a something put out by the GAO, Government Accountability Office. Opportunities exist to reduce risks and costs by evaluating different waste treatment approaches at Hanford. They put out this big, long thing about the way, how many pages is it? It's 81 pages. And it talks about how they can reclassify it and define it. Listen to this. Now, we just read it was 0.000053% that was tested. Listen to what the GAO says. I was blown away by this. According to the 21 experts that attended the GAO's meeting convened by the National Academy of Sciences, Engineers, and Medicine, both vitrification and grout could effectively treat Hanford's LAW. Uh, and what is the LAW? Uh, low active waste. So they're reclassifying it as low active waste. This is so insane. These experts stated that the current information shows that grout will perform better than the than was assumed when DOA made the decision to vitrify Hanford's low active waste. According to some experts, using grout for supplemental low active waste could help leaving the waste tanks for longer periods of time. This is Lonnie Clark again, your host with the Age of Fission radio show. Uh, after hearing that article that I read uh, in August that I found from October of 18, I hope you understand what I why I thought it was highly related to what Kevin Camps was talking about. This has been in planning for a long time. Ann White, in fact, no longer works for the Trump administration. She's no longer his advisor. She recently retired. Rick Perry is no longer with the administration. I mean, he came in and got his million dollars worth. And the man who's going to be making billions out of his work here could care less how safely that this waste is transported across America. If there, there's an accident, the Price-Anderson Act limits his liability and nobody goes to jail. So this is a very serious issue that we're talking about. And this is why as soon as I heard this uh, video from Carl Grossman did with Kevin Camps, I thought it was such a great interview because he allowed Kevin to really ex explain exactly how insane this idea is. And it is pushing ahead because the nuclear industry gets whatever it wants. Like the NRC is the Nuclear Rubber Stamp Commission, not the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. 
They don't regulate. They, what they do is they write the regulations the nuclear industry wants them to write. That's what they're calling it. I mean, it is literally a fascist state. That is literally the definition of a fascist state. When the corporations run the governmental agencies for the benefit of the corporate agencies, that's exactly what the nuclear industry is. It does cause a lot of harm. And we have a cancer epidemic. We have schizophrenia. I mean, it causes hard diseases that we know. Exposure to ongoing low-level radioactive contamination, which is really where we all are. Most of us have li are living in sites. I live in Oregon, and really, there's. I get it from Fukushima now, in the air and in the wind and in the rain. We're right on the coast, and the cesium is going back and forth. It's in the ocean. They're pouring in 100 million gallons on a daily basis. It's bad. I mean, that's just not, that doesn't even count Hanford or Diablo Canyon or the, any, of the, any of the other nuclear power plants that goes into the West Coast. I mean, each of us, when we, within the sound of my voice, the way the nuclear industry is, if you have you hearing this radio show, you probably live near some nuclear contamination. And we cannot allow them to just kick the can down the road and say, we're going to just bury it and pretend like it's not a problem. Because this is going to harm our children for four to seven generations. We're not even going to see the worst of it until four to five generations down the road. That's what studies prove. It's not some made-up system. It's, it's actually they... Biologically, they've done academic studies and understand this. It's beyond comprehension, folks. So, anyways, cheery me again, <laughs> telling you that happiness is resistance. Uh, for me, my resistance is getting people to know about this and understanding. Iodine, 129, 15 million year half-life, excuse me? Like, for real? You, you're telling me we can't do better than that? Than to figure out some way to do it than just to give it to someone's political, as political payback to let them disregard human life for political payback? Not me. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna stay silent. That's why I'm doing this radio podcast. I'm gonna end here. I can see we're coming up on the hour. I want to thank everybody who listens to my show. You're listening to Lonnie Clark with the Age of Fission radio show. Once again, I'm going to ask you to please like, subscribe, and share, share, share. Please share this information. Share the podcast. Share the video if you're listening to the video podcast of it. Tell your friends about it. You can go to kepw.org, a nonprofit 5013C in Eugene in Springfield serving Eugene Springfield area. It's, uh, they actually have an FM radio station called 97.3 FMLP. And it's really unique because it's the middle of the road, but it's a not middle of the dial channel. Most nonprofits are to the left. Well, theirs is right in the middle of the dial. And it's a nonprofit radio station. And pretty awesome. Thank you for carrying my show, you guys. And reallibertymedia.com. And you can hear my radio podcast there and the producer there Graham writes up little uh, summations of oh, they listen to the show and then they write things up so sometimes I was reading some of what they wrote about it it didn't really sound like me so but they do play my podcast and I really appreciate it um, they actually wrote on one of them something about the ignorant uh, legislators they're not ignorant they're malicious it's a huge difference they're not ignorant. Let's just be very clear. That's what tonight's show is about. They are malicious. They know that the zirconium blew up. That's what got me so excited. They knew the, blue, the zirconium blows up. They know what it's going to do. They know that there's a likelihood if you transport high-level radioactive waste on, in every form of transportation without a lot of security. And you just... Pretend that highly radioactive waste is low-level radioactive waste and disregard the extra security that it requires. It is going to be exponentially more dangerous. 
That's malicious. That is not ignorant. So, but please do go to Real Liberty Media Radio because pretty interesting guys. We have different political views, but they're super, we're Americans. This is the thing I like about us. We're all Americans and Americans accept each other. And we don't, you know, we allow each other to be different. But we give each other, you know, the interesting what we all consider to be the same rights, though. That's an, another topic that we have here. So if you go to our podcast, uh, at Real Liberty Media, you'll hear on that show some of the conversations that we have that I didn't post up on my radio show. So anyways, you guys, put your courage feet on. And remember, happiness is resistance. And there is a lot to love in life. And... Uh, it is up to us on whether we allow this to continue or not. And I say not. I say we put our voices together. We put our actions together. And I think if enough of us really contact our elected officials and put up a big enough stink, I think we can get this whole practice just shut down and put on cold ice. Delay, delay, delay. Find a reason to delay. That's what Donna Gilmore of San Onofre Safety says all the time. The best way to stop anything in the nuclear industry is demand it be delayed. So we've got to get our elected officials to delay this. Finally, I want to give a really quick thank you once again to Dr. Carl Grossman for allowing me to play his video on my podcast that he did with Kevin Camps on January 13, 2020. And that is at his channel called Enviro Video, E-N-V-I-R-O, V-I-D-E-O, number one, Enviro Video One on YouTube. And that was on January 13th, 2020, Kevin Camps on Nuclear Waste. Thank you, Dr. Grossman. And I am very much looking forward to taking you up on your offer to do an interview with my radio show about space wars. That is another hot topic that we've got to push back on. So, yes, I look forward to having you on soon. Put your courage feet on, you guys. We'll talk to you guys next week. Ciao. Thank you for joining the Age of Vision radio show with your host, Lonnie Clark. We'll be back next week to bring you more information about the nuclear industry and the harm it's causing our planet and humanity. Find all of our podcasts on Spreaker.com or on YouTube at Nuts for Art, N-U-T-Z-F-O-R-A-R-T. Thank you for being part of the solution.